Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us here at Think Tech Hawaii with retired Hawaii judge and author, Sandra Sims, with nationally and internationally respected mediator and arbitrator and former insurance executive, Rebecca Ratliff, and Mitchell Hamlin, professor of law and chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, David Larson. Well, folks, it's been an eventful week at the Supreme Court. That's a not just content, but tone and tenor of decisions that have differed quite a bit from what we've come to hope for and expect. Today, really. and today in front of us, we're going to take up the Dobbs abortion decision. When that first came out, Judge Sims, Sandra, how did that impact you? What was your first reaction? I was shocked. Although when I heard about the leak, I, sus I was holding on to the idea that it was a draft opinion and, you know, knowing what you know about, you know, how those things occur, they can change. And they can change in so many ways. And so I thought, oh, someone leaked it, it's a draft. They can't possibly go that far. I really didn't think it would occur. I honestly did not. Uh, given the, the nature of the precedents and the fact that they had really talked about that during the confirmation, so much time was spent on that. And I thought, okay, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's safe. There may be some you know, nuances and some twists and turns, but it's a relatively safe concept. And then when I heard it, I, I really was shocked and then I was sad. And then um, I don't wanna use, I was kind of disgusted. Um, you know, as a, from, a, from a judicial perspective, I'm not one to you know, jump in to be so ready to be critical of other judges and particularly the Supreme Court when we can have reasoned discussions about what they do and what they decide. But this was beyond that. It was, it felt to me like Plessy versus Ferguson that says you're not even, women are not even people. Uh, you don't get to decide what to do with your body. I mean, whatever you feel about abortion, that's not the point. The point was, it was this, a woman's decision of what to do between her and her doctor of what to do with her body in that situation. That was totally disregarded, completely and totally disregarded. And it hurt, it hurt. It actually hurt as well uh, to be viewed that way and to think that we just disregarded um, half the population in making a decision like this. It, it, it really hurt. And that's a really important insight because what the press hasn't come out and said, but we all know is Alito and the right wing crew that he's got didn't just take away a constitutional right for a woman to make that choice over her own life, her own body, her own consequences. It, it took away the legal choice entirely and left her with no choice. Mm -hmm. So except, Rebecca, how did it impact Except to you? go somewhere else. Yeah, except to go somewhere else where it's legal. Um, I, I appreciate that perspective, Judge Sims, um, because as, as a woman, um, like you've said, regardless of how anyone feels about abortion itself, the point is the, the right in situations where a woman is raped or where there is incest or where there is knowledge of a fetus that is deformed, um, a fetus with abnormalities, um, maybe a young person with a fetus that is abnormal or an older person who um, is, you know, pregnant, impregnated, and, and, the, and the baby has an abnormality. There's no right to choose at all. And there are so many conversations to be had about 
what uh, and I know uh, President Biden is looking at uh, looking at possible remedies, although um, I don't know that there's a lot of optimism around um, what he's proposing. It is it is it was a sad day. Sadness was what I felt. And then, of course, I felt, you know, the need to ask what's next. Yeah. Because if yeah, if that can happen, if if that law can be reversed, um, then you know what is who is next and what is next? Who is next? Who's next? Who's next? Uh -huh. And David, as an ally, what was um, the impact when you first saw it? Well, you know, after the draft opinion came out, then I wasn't surprised. I really did not think they were going to change that 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 was what they were going to do. So I'd say at that point. I wasn't surprised. Um, before that opinion came out, I was hopeful, um, recognizing the past and ideology of the most recent appointees and the 6-3 majority now, I did think that they would uphold the Mississippi law, um, but I didn't think they would say there's no constitutional right to abortion, period. Mm -hmm. I didn't think they'd go that far. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I was, I really was surprised by that. And uh, uh, and disappointed. And, you know, as I look at U.S. Supreme Court decisions in recent years, uh, it just seems they're getting less principled and principled. And one thing I do is I teach arbitration law. And if you look at the recent arbitration cases, um, they are very result oriented. Um, it's pretty difficult to overturn any arbitration award, um, which generally is in favor of businesses. Uh, and it's very difficult for a consumer to win any of those cases. And they seem almost purely result oriented. And it seems like this case is also, um, you know, they talked about as a justification, this idea that, well, there can't be a uh, right in the constitution because it's not rooted in history and tradition, which if you think about that, that's a, if that's the standard, you know, what are we gonna do with uh, artificial intelligence when we start getting sentient sentient machines that actually can feel and express. Well, they're certainly not in our history tradition. What are you gonna do with you know, uh, all the things that are evolving in our world? Um, but that idea of talking about, well, it's not in history tradition. I thought one of the most revealing things is that around page 30, um, Alito says that uh, the problem with Roe and Casey is that the precedents that those cases rely upon did not discuss the moral question of abortion, and that's what make those those earlier cases irrelevant. They're not binding. Um, and really, what that said to me is that uh, this is about history and tradition. It's a it, we think it's a moral question, or I think it's a moral question, and we're going to decide it. We you know we're going to decide it for all the women out in America, and uh, you know that probably is one of the most I think the most shocking and disturbing parts of it. The idea that that you know, it's a moral question. And by the way, we're going to decide it. Yes. Yes. Well, and yes. we know that Congress has had 50 years to legislatively overrule Roe v. Wade and Casey and have chosen not to do that for whatever reason. But, but there are really, really important things missing from Justice Alito's, I think it's fair to say, unprincipled decision. One is all of the myriad factors that go into the choice of the woman confronted with that unplanned or unwanted uh -huh, or dangerous uh -huh. pregnancy. Yes. And number two, the impact on her, on the family, on the community, on society, <clears throat> both personal, medical, and legal. Yes. Yeah. When people and it doesn't even it. touch on those things. It, no. does, it gives no value to those factors at all. No, well, none whatsoever. When people talk about pro-life, it's like, you know, there is another life here. You know, there's the life of the of the pregnant woman. You know, what about her life? Uh, it's like, it's off the table. It's, it's, not it's off the table. table. That's off not the part table. of the discussion. Completely. And and even, even further than that, I mean, oftentimes you'll hear uh, where those that are claiming that they're, you know, pro-life and wanting to insist that under any, under all circumstances, this woman carry this you know, pregnancy to, to fruition. No concern about what happens to that child afterwards. Exactly. There's that. Um, we don't, we, we, there's no, we don't, we, we don't want to provide for that child. Uh, 
we look at, I mean, someone had made a comment, a comparison to, uh, you know, these memes come up, the comparison to uh, wanting to protect the gun more than you want to protect um, a woman who's facing that difficult decision. The gun right is more important and, you know, coming out of the Uvalde situation, which is its own, is its own horror. Um, it's just, I, it, this is really just a very, very disheartening time. It's a sad time uh, in our country. It's actually a frightening time. Um, Cause I don't, I, 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 I tend to always look for the brighter side and I'm looking. Although there's something to be said though about how this has um, affected and brought to light um, this whole issue with abortion, which was probably not going to be on the ballot in November. That was probably not gonna be a big part of the discussion. It was gonna be other things, but I think you've really, uh, uh, they've uh, awakened a tiger who, when you're talking about, um, you know, particularly younger women, um, uh, those who kind of took these rights for granted. I think we've talked about that before, um, you know, um, and in other communities where people have taken their rights for granted because it didn't occur to them that they would ever be challenged. And here we are. Thomas says everything's on the table. One thing including that, on the table and, and will be on the ballot. And one thing that's disturbing, it seems like we've moved to a period where more than ever it's about power. Um, you know, it's about, uh, you know, I want power, I want power at any cost. You know, we see it in January 6th. We see it with you know, Merrick Garland. You know, it's not, we're going to sit on this for a year because you can't, um, you know, take the choice away from the people, wait for the election, and then, then the next time around, you do it in eight days. <laughs> you, you appoint Barrett in eight, literally eight days. Um, this is really, a, we're in a period where um, people are, 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 are after power and then exercising power in really absolute ways. Uh, and I think going back not that far, there were people that felt that, you know, it's more, there are things more important than power. And one is preservation of democracy. And even though I might have political instincts and sentiments that go with a particular person, I think it's more important for the future of the country to act in this particular way as opposed to the, this way. And today we're getting people acting in that latter way that really is not um, protecting our democracy. It's about protecting power. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. the sad um, possibility of, you know, babies being dropped off at firehouses and hospitals um, because the mother cannot take care of the baby. Um, there's, you know, no thought, you know, there's the, the pregnancy stage, but then um, as Judge Sims um, kind of poked at, it's, you know, there's also a consideration for what will happen to the children for, for mothers who cannot take care of their children. Um, yeah, so what I want to ask the Republicans, so you're going to raise taxes then, um, you know, you're going to raise taxes to make sure there are funds available to take care of these kids. <laughs> and yeah. Nobody seems eager to do that. No one wants to talk about that. They don't right. want to talk about that, but that has to be addressed. And I think there is enough, um, maybe just rage in the communities on both sides, to be honest, uh, to force those questions to be asked and answered. Uh, I think that's, I really, I, I, that part is maybe the positive in this, is that that question can no longer be brushed off because it's real. And then of course, you know, you're looking at those states uh, like Illinois, who are surrounded by states who are banning abortion. And what, and that's, Illinois is not the only one, but you know, there's, theirs is particularly poignant because they are literally surrounded. Uh, so, I'm by, in Minnesota, same, same situation. Yeah, not really. yeah, yeah, yeah. So are we gonna start talking and you're hearing people talking about, well, we're gonna restrict travel. Wait a minute now, that's, that's something you can't do. That's a, <laughs> we've got a constitutional provision with regard to that, clearly. Uh, so 
there's I'm hearing those kind of conversations about if you're going to be traveling to do this and we're going to make that a crime. That's clearly a constitutional violation. Um, and then there's also that whole, you know, question of if there is to be traveling done to, to that, who gets to do that? Who gets to travel? Those that have, those that have um, access to the funds and ability to travel. Then you've already addressed another issue of, you yeah. know, the inequality of it as well. So there's just, you know, and particularly those cities and counties around the board, uh, the borders of those states um, who are already bracing for, um, you know, waves of folks coming there to, you know, have abortion or counseling or services. And they're finding ways to boost that. So I, maybe there's hope. Uh, well, there are organizations and nonprofits already being formed um, to to support the finances that uh, are um, predicted to arise around um, you know those those efforts that you mentioned, Judge Sims. And there are corporations, including Disney. Disney's one of them. I did a little reading about the insurance industry um, and how hmm. it's responding to um, to this new uh, reality. And um, okay. there are yeah, there are businesses who have said that they will reimburse staff who need to travel travel for reproductive treatment. Um, there are co companies, large companies, global companies uh -huh, that uh -huh. have updated their travel and lodging benefits uh, to make all types of medical yeah. okay. care more accessible. Um, there are insurance carriers that have um, expressed that they intend to expand their health care um, offering to include travel travel costs for staff who need to head out of state to seek reproductive care. Um, okay. And it's pretty broad. Re the reproductive care and medical services is pretty broad. Yeah, Target Corporation here in the Twin Cities is doing that also. Oh. That's now, another thing that's really frightening about this is that criminalization of, uh, of people say, well, I don't think women should be prosecuted, but I, I fully anticipate that will happen. And this whole idea that uh, anybody that assists this person will be in a criminal conspiracy kind of situation. That's terrifying. Accessories, um, yes. Yeah, and then this idea, you know, what happens if states do, or Texas might extend that idea of this vigilante idea that your private citizens can, can prosecute violations, uh, you know, and then what kind of evidence is going to be um, discoverable you know, can we go into all your social media and all your medical records to kind of see what's happening with your, with your, with your maternal health? Um, uh, that's yeah. I don't know where that stops. Um, yeah. And, that, and that's yeah. really that's very frightening. Yeah. And then there's the selective prosecution portion of it as well, because it's certainly going to be unevenly applied uh, because there's some some. Uh, prosecutors and district attorneys that just aren't going to do it because, you know, they have the discretion to take a case or not take a case. So that's going to occur. And then you'll have those disparities. Just, yeah. Dis yeah, yeah, yeah. More so disparities. Another level of that as well. So I, I it's, it's, it's a scary time. So what's the effect on that critical pre-abortion step of just getting the education, the information, the reproductive choice and care to the people who most need it. How does this decision impact that? Well, you know, you've got states like Florida that say you can't, you know, we don't want you to talk about safe sex relationships. You know, I don't see why they couldn't say not only are, is abortion illegal in Florida, but you can't even talk about it. You can't even educate. You, we don't even want people to know it exists. Um, I could see that happening. Yeah, yeah, that's having a chilling effect on on the role of groups like Planned Parenthood. I think it's because Planned Parenthood is just it's not just about doing abortions. It's actually a med, it's a it's a full blown medical center that provides all kinds of services uh, for you know related to reproductive rights related to to women's issues and what we're what this does is basically kind of silences them and prevents them from doing 
the majority of the work that they do, which is actually not abortion. Yeah, they're a resource it is center. That. It is the counseling. It is the it is the mammograms. It is the you know, it is all of those services related to women's health because that's what Planned Parenthood is. So in many instances, they've been silenced or certainly attempts to silence and misrepresent what they're really doing. And then that basically kind of makes for women who are actually in need of services short of abortion, unable to get that because that's the, that would be the main source of it, it would be plan or parenthood or other, and then other nonprofits will have to just kind of step in and fill that void. But I think just that's the other thing that that misconception about what Planned Parenthood does in terms of providing for women's health issues. Because they're huge. I mean, they're, they're, that's, they're, that's their entire mission, pretty much. And they don't get to do that. Yeah, and you have to think about that void. You know, so so mm-hmm. again, that whole idea about, about taxes and about public health, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, are, mm-hmm. you gonna, are you going to you gonna fill that void? You know, are you going to... Are you going to accept um, a new tax burden because these other organizations that provide that care are are being weakened, maybe even eliminated? You know, are you going to are, are you going to agree to that? And of course, my fear is that the answer is no. I, I'm not going to be taxed more to do that. So we have a Supreme Court that, at least in this last week has evinced a trend toward taking away really critical rights and protections for women's reproductive health and choices, for protection of students and members of society against yeah. gun violence, for protection of the environment against fossil fuel dominance, and voting rights and protections that are critical. So out of one side of his mouth, Justice Alito says, well, we're just giving it back to the states to determine for the people through their elected representatives. But that's the same court that has been circumscribing and restricting the voting protections for those elected officials to actually reflect the majority of the people. And in fact, we know that polls out there are showing well over 50%, 56%, in some cases more than 60%, favor some rights to abortion and a minority, 40% or less, disfavor it. So this is not a court that's reflecting protection of the rights of the majority or of the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a reason why many of those rights were given to the you know, to the federal government to enforce because states weren't enforcing them. I mean, clearly in the voting rights, I mean, that's why there is a voting rights act in the first place is because some people did not want other folks to vote. There was, there was a reason for that. Same thing, you know, with when you look at so many other areas, you know, in education, there was, there was a reason for there having to be a, uh, a federal oversight of some of these matters. And so to just say, oh, let the people decide. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of what happened in the ni- early 19th, mid 19th century. That's why we had a civil war, to be honest. Well, we are rolling backwards in, in lots of ways. We are rolling backwards. We're rolling back backwards. down the hill, man. I'm telling you, break <laughs> next speed. You know, I think the science is settled for climate change. Um, you know, the vast majority uh, of, of educated um, scientists and meteorologists would say that this is this is happening. So when you get a decision saying that the experts and that's who um, the EPA, that's who they are. They are the experts. Uh-huh. They don't uh-huh. have the authority to take measures that are going to reduce uh, greenhouse gases and shift people from fossil fuels to alternative energy sources, which will make it better. And you say, well, they can't do that. Um, that's the, that is again, very disturbing and frightening. Very, very, very. And one last one too, I just was noting on the, on the uh, prayer in school decision, while they're saying it's okay for this coach to do that, someone raised the question, what if that religion that, what if it's, it's, what if it's not a Christian? What if it's someone wanting to do their, you know, Muslim prayers at the end of, 
Uh, or, 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 I, I like the Wiccan in the classroom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, Hello. I mean, you know, what about that? What, what's going to happen what then? Yeah. <laughs> what's going to happen then? Is that going to yeah. be? Are you going to be as? So I'm, I'm. I'm almost wanting someone to do that. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, so just, we can. <laughs> so let's, let's test this principle. Let's like, test this principle and see: yeah. Is this what you really, really, really want? Yeah. But before we go, we can't not at least celebrate today for Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. I, I, yeah. I, I participated a few weeks ago in a in a in a program for Juneteenth where we, you know, celebrated her, and uh, I wish her well. She is. I wish her well. She's got a work cut out for her. Yeah, that's right. I wish her well. Yeah. On the news today, they made the good point that, of course, the um, the same um, percentage that exists six three. Uh, the the nu numerically um, that you know there's a uh, uh, liberal minority, but they have the benefit. They'll have the benefit of her perspective, and I thought that that's yeah, yeah that's a silver lining. Yeah, which is the which is the which is the big piece of the importance of diversity in anyway. So you're having all these perspectives, and it does affect and color how things get perceived. And fortunately, some people uh, I, I won't go there. <sighs> well, well, get perceived and get changed because you do have the power power to write a dissent. And if you can bring a different perspective that people haven't understood or recognized before, um, maybe that can lead to a change, even though in this, on this day, it happened to be a dissent. It's the future of the you, you know, you got it. Yeah, you're right, David. That's, that's, yeah, that's there. That's there. I wish her well. I mean, I'm happy for her, although it's, it's a crazy time, but I wish her the absolute best. So in finishing up for today, and thanks for all the wonderful thoughts, insights, and perspectives, we finish with a hope for reversal of this change of direction away from the expansion of rights and protections for the people that were too long excluded, marginalized, underserved, and for all of us to come together to assert and protect those rights again. Peace, thanks for joining us. Come back in two weeks. We'll have lots more to talk about. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.